Anyway, I, uh, anyway, I've enjoyed Philippians, and I still am enjoying Philippians, and I plan to enjoy today in Philippians. Uh, hope you, uh, hope you do. Hope you, you, you got your ears on, so you can hear. You know, a lot of times in the Scripture, Jesus says, "Let him who has ears hear what the Spirit of God is saying." Really, it's what he's saying is, "You got your ears on, good buddy." You know, I mean, yeah. that's really what he's saying. He said, "You're listening to this. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you?" And um, and uh, because that's what God's Spirit does through His Word, is He speaks to us and He, and He shares with us um, what it is that, that that our heart needs to be concerned with and what will affect our lives. And that's what the Word is all about. It's not just so that somebody can stand up and tell you what they think about things. It's so that the Lord can share with you what He wants you to hear. And take away because when you walk out those doors out there, the problems that you had when you walked in those doors out there, they're still out there. Um, however, what he wants to do in here is change you to the point where when you face them again, they don't, they don't look the same. They're not the same. And that you have a way of dealing with these issues of life. Because we all have issues and there's no magic, okay? Look at your neighbor and say, I'm sorry, there's no magic. All right, I'm sorry, but I'm sorry, but uh, there's no magic up in here, so we're not going to be able to just make things go away or change. All right, we can we can help you change, and the Holy Spirit can can revolutionize you on the inside so that it seems like everything has changed. But uh, magic is, you know, I mean, I know everybody wants magic, and you want things to happen immediately. Come to an altar, pray, boom, everything's changed. But, uh, but that's not generally how it happens. You know, now the Lord can do anything, and please don't go out saying, that pastor doesn't believe in God. No, I know God can do anything, but I know the way he normally does things. I've been with him a long, long, long time, <laughs> long time. And I know generally the way he does it. What, what are you saying, Mark? You're trying to preach again? Oh, uh, this is not a fast food restaurant. Okay, good. There you go, buddy. Uh, Mark, he's trying to pre he's trying to break Billy uh, and, and Brian and Beth. He's trying to break in. He's trying to break into their club. He won't let them talk. Yes, <laughs> the killer bees. I know some of you have been. You said who? Had, what is he even talking about? Well, Beverly, Brian, and Billy always they add in stuff when I'm preaching. You know, so. So anyway, I call them the killer bees, but Mark, Mark's not a bee, so you can't get in on that. So, <laughs> all right, bro. It's all right. I know you're growing, and I'm proud of you. I really am. You and your brother, Mike. I'm proud of both of you, but I don't know. I might have to work on something with you. But anyway, we're in Philippians. We're in Philippians, and, uh, and we're talking about uh, today, as a matter of fact, the title, of course, is just, you, you see it in your notes I gave you, Satisfaction. And, of course, I couldn't even say the word satisfaction without thinking of 1965 and the Rolling Stones singing, I ain't got no satisfaction. Um, how many of you remember that live? <laughs> all right, <laughs> yeah, all us old people, yeah, <laughs> down with the people, yeah. All of us old people remember that, 1965. Man, I was just a, like a, almost a young teenager at that time. I was, uh, but anyway, that became an anthem, didn't it, really? Uh, Became an anthem for our rebellious 60s generation, right? And those crazy 70s that followed it too, where we thought we could have all the sex and drugs we wanted and it wouldn't matter, right? But we found out, we found out it, you can't do that. No, it does matter and you can't do that and mess you up too bad. But we were searching for satisfaction. We tried to find satisfaction, but uh, can't find it there. And the Lord, you know, uh, thankfully the Lord spared us. And we lived through all of that craziness. And we have found out that regardless of what Madison Avenue says, because Madison Avenue has a whole industry that is intended to create dissatisfaction. You know this, right? There's a whole business model created to create dissatisfaction. It's called the advertising industry. The advertising industry, the goal of the industry is to show you something on TV or in a magazine or on a radio commercial or, or, or whatever uh, format it might be to say to you, <laughs> you're not happy. You're not satisfied. 
and you're not going to be satisfied until you spray this or roll this or drink this or eat this or use this or chop your food with it or whatever it might be. I don't know how we lived all these years without slicing and dicing and all that kind of stuff, you know, probably propel. And, um, but wait, there's more. And, uh, you know, we, uh, anyway, we, and all of that's created to tell us. So, you know, really, if you listen to Madison Avenue, satisfaction's really not very hard to find, is it? I mean, you can buy it, right? You can just get the right product or get the right uh, perfume or the right, you know, uh, whatever deodorant, whatever it might be, toothpaste, uh, whatever it is. You just get it and, boy, you will be just satisfied. Uh, the only trouble is, have, you, have any of you ever bought a product thinking that? Uh, <laughs> I know you wouldn't admit it, <laughs> but, uh, but you probably have. Uh, probably didn't think that deeply and it wasn't earth shattering for you, but you thought, oh, I, I'll be better with this because, I mean, look at what it does. But you found to your dismay that it just did not do what it promised that it would do, right? But you can send it back, right? Yeah, 30 days, send it back. Cost you about five times as much as it did to buy it to send it back. If you can find the box, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah, always save the box. Huh? <laughs> Don't put the box... And, and so, uh, God is very interested in the fact that we would be satisfied. And he tells us that we can be satisfied in life. The whole book of Philippians is about joy, right? You remember this? I've said it every time I've preached. You, certainly, you should remember this. The book's about joy. It's the joy book. As a matter of fact, the first verse we read today, we'll say it one more time, rejoice. And it's talking about being joyful in the Lord. Uh, you can't think about joyful without thinking about being, what is it, delighted? I mean, is the joy, would it, be, would it be like delighted? Would it be uh, uh uh, elated, you know, would be another word. I know you think happiness, right? Happy, everybody thinks, okay, if I'm joyful, I'm happy. But really, happiness is really a little bit different than joy because happiness depends on what happens. That's why they call it happiness. It depends on what your hap is. If your hap is good, then you are happy. If your hap is bad, then you are unhappy. So happiness is like a thermometer, really, if you want to get kind of an analogy for it. Happiness is like a thermometer. It goes up and down with conditions, right? But joy, on the other hand, is like a thermostat. Joy sets the conditions of your life. So when we think about, you know, being joyful in the Lord, we're thinking about something that is uh, deep within us that makes everything seem I, I want to say, make it seem all right, even though it's not all right. And, and maybe that's carrying it just a little bit too far. But, but let's just say this. It just kind of takes the sting out of stuff that doesn't seem to be what we want it to be. There's an underlying something on the inside of us that just supports us uh, when things just don't seem to be happening in the right way. And our hap is bad. We can still have strength on the inside. But you remember what, what they said about Jesus. Uh, Jesus. They call Jesus, and the scripture calls him in this particular verse, a man of sorrows, right? Remember? And he, it says it like this, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Pretty good description of Jesus. But yet, when it talks about him going to the cross, it says, but yet he, and he went forth for the joy that was before him. So in other words, even though something was very sorrowful and he was going to die on the cross and that wasn't happy, he was full of joy about that because that was his purpose. So even though he was sorrowful about leaving his friends, there was something on the inside of Jesus that made everything that seemed bad seem okay because of what was on the inside of him and that little emotional tag we would call joy. Well, that's what the book of Philippians is about. It's about this joy. Now, how do you have this joy? 
Are you born with this joy? You know, a lot of people that you admire that seem to be joyful no matter what. And it just, have you ever been around a person that's just joyful no matter what? I mean, I'm not talking about some silly clown, goofy acting, laughing. I'm talking about somebody that just didn't seem to fall apart when everything around them was falling apart. Somehow, when things didn't happen just right, it wasn't that they were excited about it, but they, it, it didn't blow them away. And, and they seemed to have this, this, this glee, this just joy, this support, this uh, strength on the inside of them, no matter what. Did, didn't that just kind of grate on your nerves, really, a little bit? You, you want to look at them and say, do you realize what's happening, you know? <laughs> Hello, are you there? Do you know what just happened to you? Yeah. But according to the Apostle Paul and what he says about it, and we're about to read it in just a moment now, it's not something that you're born with. As a matter of fact, most of us probably are born with just the opposite of joy. We're born with a great deal of pessimism and um, defeatism. And, uh, well, like I said last week, you know, our lives, in, in life... Many of us live lives expecting the worst. <laughs> you know, when something happens, it's like we jump right to the worst. And then we go, whew, I'm glad that didn't happen, you know. So that's really more like us. So if you think, well, to be joyful, I'm going to have to be born with joy, then I've got some good news for you. <laughs> uh, you don't have to be born with it to have it. Well, how would, I, how would I get such joy? You know, how, how would I be obedient to God? If the book of Philippians is about joy, in spite of all of these issues and all of these things of life, my work doesn't go good, I get fired, I, my family's not working right, I'm divorced, I, you know, uh, uh, my business just failed, I'm not, my neighbors are driving me crazy, and uh, just name the list of whatever it might be. How, how can you be joyful with that? Your help is not good, right? You're unhappy. Yeah. How could you be happy like that? Well, the good news is the Apostle Paul tells us how we can have this. Would you be, if, if I could tell you what he said and, uh, and you could understand what I was saying to you, would you want to hear this? Would this be something you would be interested in? Not okay, because if not, I mean, it's time to go home. You know. Okay, we've already taken the offering, so it's time to go. <laughs> all right, all right. Let me tell you. I just wanted to see if I was preaching the right crowd. Here we go. Here are the verses. Verse ten, chapter four. <clears throat> but I rejoice. There we are. You know, have you noticed that almost every passage we've read has had something in it like I rejoiced or rejoice or, you know, seventeen times in the book. It's only four chapters long. 17 times in the book he says joy or rejoice or be happy, rejoicing. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care has come. Uh, your care for me has flourished again. That sounds like a criticism, doesn't it, really? You know, he's in prison, right? You remember this? He's in there for trumped up charges. They brought up some crazy charges against the Apostle Paul that he was subverting the kingdom of Rome and blah, blah. And they threw him in jail, and they're going to kill him. And he's been in jail two years, and Philippians was written while he was in jail. So just in case some of you think, well, if I had it made like him, I'd be joyful too. All right, well, there you go. Now you know he's in jail. He's got a Roman guard chained to this arm and a Roman guard chained to this arm. And every, every 12 hours, they change guards. They change him to another. So he got another one to know. And he's sitting in this damp dungeon in Rome awaiting... Um, his, uh, his death. So if that just gives you an idea of who's writing to you, you need to know that, all right? This is not somebody sitting in an ivory tower uh, waiting for his prince to come or something, you know. This is, this is somebody who's facing death, and notice what he says. He says, I'm so, man, I'm just, I'm just rejoicing because your care for me has flourished again, uh, you're back with me. And then, he, and then he realizes, I'm sure, how that sounds. And he says, uh, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. In other words, I'm not trying to be critical of you. Uh, I know that it's hard for you to come here because, it's, it, by the way, 600 miles away is Philippi. 
And they don't, remember, they don't have jets. They don't have cars. They don't have, so he's 600 miles away from the church that's trying to help him, take care of him. So he said, I know, you, you know, you've always cared, so I'm not doubting your care for me. I know that it's just really hard for you to get by, okay? But, uh, but you lack opportunity. And then now here he goes, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned. Everybody say learned. learned. I have learned. You mean you weren't born with what you're about to say? Uh, you, mean, you mean it wasn't magic? <laughs> you didn't go to an altar and somebody laid hands on you and prayed and you got it? No, he said, for I have learned. I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. So if he learned to be content in whatever condition he finds himself, I'm just thinking I can too. All right? Let's see what else he says. I, now, here's, here's another learning word. I know how to be abased. How do you know how? I learned. <laughs> it didn't just automatically happen to me. I know how because I learned how. I know how to be abased. That means I know how to not have anything is what he's really saying. I know how to live with nothing. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. It was the Apostle Paul that says, um, uh, having everything yet possessing nothing. Think about that. He says, we have everything, but we possess nothing. Now, think about how frustrating that would be if you were the devil. Think about it. All right, you're going to come to me. You're the devil. And you're going to say to me, who has everything but possesses nothing, you're going to say to me, if you will do this, I will give you this. And then what am I going to say? Don't need it. Got everything. And then you say, well, if you don't do it, I'm going to take it away from you. You said, you can't. I ain't got nothing. Think about how frustrating that would be. Having everything, yet possessing nothing. Paul says, I know how to be full of stuff. And I know how to have nothing in life. I know what both of those things feel like. And, 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 and then he says that famous line that we always remember, verse three, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then I skipped a couple of verses, a few verses, because I'm going to get on them next week. But I want you to see verse 19 because it really fits right here. He says, and my God shall supply all Everybody say, all. All, all. What does all mean? Everything. All means all, right? It doesn't just mean I'm going to supply your spiritual needs, right? I'm going to supply your church needs, right? I'm going to supply, it means all. I'm going to supply all your needs according to my riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Now, the Apostle Paul tells us, how to be satisfied. And here's what he says. In order to be satisfied, you have to learn some things. Does that spoil it for you? You thought it was going to be magic, right? <laughs> right? You thought, okay, pastor's going to line us up and come up and go, right, you got it, you got it, you got it, you got it, you got it. No, no, you're going to have to learn some things. And I've written them down in your outline for you. There are four things. That he says here, I'm not sure if this qualifies Wesley as a sermon because we're only supposed to have three points, right? Three points. Wesley's in hermeneutics class, so hermeneutics means I'm going to teach you how to preach. That's what that means. And um, it's a class you take in college if you're going to be a preacher. You know, if you're taking Bible classes, you're going to take hermeneutics, which means I'm going to teach you how to preach. Yep, okay, okay, I'm cut. I receive that in Jesus' name. All right. Number one, moving on quickly, four valuable lessons on how to be satisfied, how to be content in life, how no matter what state you find yourself, therewith to be content. Here's number one, learn to avoid comparisons. If I'm going to be content in life, 
I am going to have to stop comparing myself and my stuff to you and other stuff. Because I'll never be happy as long as I'm comparing. You know why? Because somebody always has better stuff than we do. Now, I'm telling you what, and I'm, I've said this before to you, and I know that you won't do it, but I'm still going to say it again. If you will, will do as little as possible on any of these social media platforms that are out there right now, you will be happier in life. Are you hearing me? That means all of these, and I'm not even going to start naming them because I don't know all of them because I don't do any of them. And I know you say, okay, you can say that because you're old and you don't care. Well, probably so. That's probably right. Because I'm not right all up in the middle of social life like a lot of you young people are. I mean, it seems like you, you walk around in danger at all times because you can't keep your eyes off of this device you have because some, something is so interesting to you. And you know what it is? Somebody else's life. That's what it is. Now, on all of these platforms, you watch other people live life that's happier than you. There's, they're more satisfied. They're prettier than you. They've got a more interesting life. They love each other. They're happy. Look at them. Look at all the marvelous things they do and the places they go. And look at all of these pictures. They're smiling and they're beautiful people. My Lord, what about my sorry, pitiful life? I might as well die, you know, eat worms and die. Uh, and that's the way you feel because you're watching somebody else's life that you think is better than yours. And I'm going to just ask you this question, and I'm just putting this before you for your consideration now. When you look at some of these platforms with all this happiness on it and all this beauty and all this joy and all this perfection, you do realize that you're looking at the A side of somebody's life, right? Right? Now, by the A side, do you understand what I mean? I put in your notes, you're going to have to ask some old person what A and B sides mean because we had 45s and 33s, and we even had um, 78s. That shows how old I am. The one with a little tiny hole in the middle that spun real fast. Uh, we even had 78s. And they had an A side and flip it over, B side. The hit was on the A side. The song they wanted you to hear and the song you bought that for is on the A side. On the B side was the junk. On the B side was something that they didn't think would make it, but they didn't want to give you two songs for the price of one, so they put the real good one on the A side and then on the B side they just put some filler, you know. However, every once in a while, the B side ended up being better than A side. They messed up. They didn't know us, did they? But every once in a while, you'd get a B side that was good. But what I'm saying to you about the A and B side of life is when you're looking at social media, you're looking at the A side of people's lives. You're looking at the side they want you to see. You're, you're looking at the, at the things they're doing that they say, this is me. This is what my life is about. This is my family. They took 14 pictures in order to get one that looks beautiful. And they discarded the other ones. And then they made everybody get dressed up and they made everybody look good. And then when they go down the river or they go to a concert or they do something interesting in life, it's always on there because they, they say, this is the way we live. This is our life. And you look at it and just go, they're so exciting, and they have such a happy life, and I don't ever do anything, and my husband, I'm going to kill him. You can't even get your kids to take a picture, much less have some <laughs> happiness, joy. And I'm going to tell you what, some of you people, and I've seen it because Tanya shows them to me um, every once in a while when something's really interesting. You people, man, some of you guys are experts. You are professionals at taking selfies. I'm serious. 
Those selfies look way better than you. Oh, wait, no, wait, wait. I didn't mean to say that. I didn't mean to say that. It didn't come out right. You, you just look really nice in these selfies, you know. It's like a cosmopolitan model or something. I mean, it's like gorgeous. And I'm going, who is that? And it's you, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, uh, comparison. See, that's comparison. And you live life this way. And I'm going to tell you what you'll find out. There's always going to be somebody that has more money than you. There's always going to be somebody that has a, a, a more interesting family than you. And there's always going to be somebody who has fewer problems than you do. So when you, when you live life by comparison, life is going to fall flat for you many times. I can remember, and this may be just one of those little childish examples for you, but I can remember I was 13 years old. And, of course, you know the story of our life. We didn't have a whole lot. But I, I finally uh, worked enough and Mama put in enough and stuff like that. And I got a little mini bike. And many of you don't even know what I'm talking about, but some of you older people did a little mini bike. It was like a little, little motorcycle. Little, it wasn't really a motorcycle. It was just a frame with a motor on it and, you know, and a wheel and a throttle and hopefully some brakes, you know. But um, <laughs> not always. <laughs> but anyway, it was about this big and it was like a little lawnmower motor. And, you know, and, and But it was fun to me. And I got one, I think for Christmas one year or something like that. And I was so happy. I was so joyful. Oh, it was wonderful. Until my friend from the next country road down got a, he had a 250 Yamaha dirt bike. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He drives around the corner, wing, 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 you know, and it's about this tall, and it's got mirrors on it, and, and it's just fast. And, wah, wah, wah. and then I, he drives up by me, and here I am sitting there. <laughs> and he's up here going, wing, wing, wing. And man, he can fly off and just throw gravel all over the place. And, it, and I watched him drive off, and, 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 and the joy of my life just went, And no longer was I satisfied with the joy of my life, my little mini bike. What happened to me? I wanted one of those. Because now he had one and, and I wanted one. I put three common misconceptions in your notes about... I, by the way, how many of you have been happy with the home you live in until you go look at a new house? Hello? <laughs> that model house, boy, I, man, I wish we had one like that. Mm -mm. And all of a sudden, the home you lived in and were so happy with, it just jumped now. But I put three common misconceptions about happiness. Look at them, I, I just because I, I want to just mention them to you a second. In your notes, number, it's under that uh, learn to avoid comparisons. Number one, I must have what others have to be happy. That's a misconception. I have to have what other people have to be happy. There's always somebody, like I said, has more money than you, has greater opportunities, live in better places, have fewer problems, and blah, blah, blah. Number two, I must be liked by everyone. Is that even possible? Jesus couldn't even do that, right? <laughs> okay. So you can, that, that's, drop that from your, from your scale of what it takes to be happy, all right? Because no, you, you're not going to be liked by everyone. I don't care what those backstabbers say. Number three, having more will make me happy. If you believe that, just look at people who have more. Are they happy? Watch a soap opera. How many of you have ever watched a soap opera? Sitting on the edge of night without a guiding light. <laughs> waiting for hope for tomorrow and <laughs> got caught in a secret storm, sure as the world turns. Uh, anyway, yeah, I had a lot of time on my hands at one time. Um, but have you ever watched one? I mean, that's just an example. Uh, we watched JR in Dallas and all that when I was young. I don't even know what, I don't even know what's on now. What, I, they're still there, JR and the boy. But anyway, all right, just look at anybody who has everything they want and tell me, are they happy? They're the most miserable conniving, scheming, backstabbing, evil bunch I've ever seen in my life. Nobody's happy. Everybody's trying to find something else or somebody else to make them happy. 
None of them work for a living. What do they do for a living? Man, I've tried to figure out, man, these people just live. They live in these mansions, and, they, they wanna, and, and they're all beautiful and dressed nicely, and they go everywhere they want, and they have wonderful automobiles, and, and, and nobody goes to work. I'm thinking, who in the world? Where, what, how did they get the money? I guess they won the lottery or something. But anyway, um, all of them <laughs> won it. But the root problem of discontentment is comparing myself to others. Let me show you a verse. This is another verse written by the Apostle Paul to his preacher boy son, Timothy, who, by the way, became pastor of the church at Philippi. He wrote this to Timothy. He said, now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. I'm a pastor, been one for 43 years, something way up like that, done many, many, many funerals my lifetime. I'll tell you something I've never seen. I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. Not one my entire life. As a matter of fact, and I've said this to some of you before, you, I know you always remember everything I say, but, but it, you know, forgive me for saying it again. Uh, if you get a suit, if, if, if you are going to be buried and you don't have a suit and your family wants you to have a suit so you can lay in the coffin with a suit, and they buy that suit from the funeral home. That suit does not even have any pockets in it. Do you know this? All right, next time somebody's in the coffin and you say, do you get this suit from the funeral home? Yeah. All right, reach your hand down in there and try to see if you... <laughs> I'll bail you out, really. I'll real, I, I bail you out of jail when they come get you for you know, violating or desecrating the coffin. I'll say, well, we just want to see if they had any pockets. They don't have any pockets. You know why? Because you're not carrying anything with you. Nothing. You came into this world with nothing, and you leaving it with nothing. You, they ask you, how much did Howard Hughes leave? You say, he left everything, because he did. And so Paul says to Timothy, look, you will be happy if you understand that life is not made up of what you have and having food and having clothing, with these we shall be content. So, number one thing we have to learn. Look at your neighbor and say, learn. learn. We have to learn is don't compare yourself. Stop that comparison junk. It will not allow you to be happy and joyful in life. It messes you up. Number two. Let's see what else he said. Learn to adjust to change. Change is inevitable. Life is going to change. Uh, I know I probably don't have to say that to anybody who is a member of this church because you certainly have seen change, right? You certainly live change. You live change, don't you? So the big question becomes, how do you handle change? Now, look, I'm going to tell you, and you can just go ahead and write this down, and I don't care where you live or how much you try to hermit yourself away from life or whatever else you might try to do to avoid change. Change is going to catch you because everything changes. Look at your neighbor and say, it, life changes. So the question then becomes, how do you handle the changes in your life? Because your ability to handle the changes in your life is what determines whether you can be joyful in life or not. Because if you, if you can't handle change, you are not going to be joyful in life very often because it's going to be consistently changing. Have you ever heard anybody say, uh, when you said, well, man, how you doing? And he said, uh, pretty good under the circumstances. Yeah. And then you thought, what you doing under the circumstances? <laughs> right? <laughs> what you doing under there? Because circumstances, I, I, I used to say circumstances are like a feather mattress. If you get under them, if you get on top of them, you'll sleep softly. If you get under them, they'll suffocate you. But now, you young generation, you don't even know what a feather mattress is. Right. So now I say you get under one of these, uh, what, uh, fiber foam or comfort fit or uh, what did I write in there? I 
Memory foam. Tanya wrote that memory foam in there because I couldn't even remember what it was. <laughs> circumstances are like memory foam. And, and so there are three types of circumstances in life that we need to prepare for, those that we can control and we do. Circumstances like that thermostat right there or there, you know, the room temperature, okay, we can control that and we do. Uh, the channel that the TV is on, we can control that and we do. Uh, then there are the types of, of changes that happen that we can control and we don't like the fact that we're lazy or the fact that we're complacent or the fact that we're uh, procrastinators. and you know, uh, We could change that, but a lot of times we don't. And then things that we can't control. Most of you know what most of life is made up? Of things we can't control. Things that we don't have any control. They're going to they're gonna change and I don't have any ability to change the outcome of this thing. So the key to adjusting is to have a good sense of humor. Now, I'm not talking about you have to be a clown, you know, and you have to go around telling jokes. I'm just saying the key to making adjustments to change in life is for you to not take yourself so seriously and to not think that the way you think is the way everybody thinks. You know, that's a problem we have. I've been in deacon's meetings before. I better not even get on that. I mean, I guarantee you that there are people, most of, some of them may even be sitting in this sanctuary right now, who think everybody thinks the way they think. If it's too hot, they think everybody's too hot. If it's too cold, they think everybody's too cold. If it's too loud, they think it's too loud for everybody. If they don't like what was said, they think everybody didn't like what was said. If they misunderstood something, they think everybody misunderstood something because life is all about them. And I'm just saying to you that in order to learn change in life, you can't take yourself that seriously. You have to learn to laugh at yourself sometimes. You have to learn to say, what was I thinking? And if you can't do that, let me tell you what kind of problem you got. It's pride. That's the problem. You just, you just think, okay, I got to be the greatest. And I'm the best. And how dare anybody think that I've made a mistake in life? The great one has spoken. No. You have to learn how to change. All right, let me go on. I'll get in trouble right there. Number three, learn to draw on Christ's power. All right, so we, we don't... We, Here's what we have to learn. We, we have to quit comparing ourselves to each other and quit looking at all those beautiful selfies and thinking that's the way they are because that's not how they are most of the time either. And then get, get, get over yourself. Uh, you got to change. I got to change. We have to change. Life changes. The world changes. Everything changes in life. And number three, uh, I've got a power that's greater than myself and that power can help me live life in a joyful way, in a content way. It's verse 13 is that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That is a confidence right there. Paul's saying, look, let me tell you something. I know all this, this world may throw this junk at me. This world may be about to annihilate me. It may look like this is the end of my life and, and circumstances are horrible and I'm just miserable down here and I'm in a bad place. But I'm going to tell you something. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do you hear the confidence in that? So it takes confidence to be joyful in life. Not only does it, does it take recognizing of these circumstances and getting past circumstances, it takes some confidence to be joyful in life. I, I can't quote that verse without remembering Justin when he was a little thing, playing baseball, and, and he, had his, he had his little ball cap, and he, and he had written, taken a marker, and he had written in the top, the brim of his cap, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And he'd be out there on that mound. He'd be looking, and, and I'd give him a little signal what to throw. And, and, he'd, he'd, and he'd look. He'd get back on that rubber like this. He'd look like that. And, and, and every time, wouldn't he, babe, he'd look up at that hat. You can see him doing like just like that. Every time, he looked right up at that hat. And then he looked back at that batter, and it was, woe is me. Here it would come. 
and I and he did it every time. And you could take his little hat, and it it'd be about half gone cause of sweat and stuff, but it'd be in there. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Just a reminder, just a reminder that there's a greater power than ourselves. Paul says, I can cope with life. I can cope with change. I can cope with loss. I can cope with fear because I have an external power source that strengthens me. How do you know if you are depending on yourself and not Christ? Very much so. Brian said, you get tired. That's exactly how you know. You wear yourself out trying to do all the right things, trying to say all the right things, trying to be the right thing, trying to be everything for everybody, trying to make everybody happy. Try to make everybody satisfied in life. Jesus couldn't even do that, guys. You'll wear yourself out trying to be all of these things that you think that you ought to be in life and that everybody expects you to be. Paul says, no, look, Christ can be everything in my life, but I might not be everything in my life. I think I put a verse up here that I think we need to look. Yeah, here it is, 2 Corinthians 12. Paul wrote 2 Corinthians also. He said, and he, and, and he, and he said to me, this is, Paul's got this thorn in the flesh, and all of you probably, if you've been in church very much, you've heard about Paul and his thorn in the flesh. Uh, he had some kind of something going on, most likely physical, uh, we really don't know. I say we. I mean, I really haven't considered it a whole lot other than the fact that he said he had one. It doesn't matter to me what it was. He said it was a problem. And he said, I prayed and I asked God three times to take this problem away from me. And he said, you know what the Lord said? He said, I'm not taking it away from you. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in, your, in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul said, you know what God told me when I prayed? I prayed three times, God, this is, this is not right. Take it away from me. I don't deserve this, God. Take it away from me. I'm trying to serve you all I can. Can't you see? I'm trying to do it all. God, I've given up everything for you. I've, I've given up my life. I've given up my money. I've given up my time. I've given up my effort. I've given up, and what am I getting out of this? Nothing. I've given it all up, and I've got this sickness or this ailment or whatever it might be, and I've asked you three times to take it away from me, and you keep saying no, 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 no. So what good does it do to serve somebody like that? And he said, here's what God said to me. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. He said, you know why I'm not going to take it away? Because I want you to know that you can live with this because I'm going to give you the strength to live with it. And you're going to, that's right, and you're going to be way stronger living with it and knowing that I'm living with you with it than you ever would have been if I had taken it away from you. Let me ask you, if God answered every prayer you prayed, what kind of person would you be? You'd be the most childish, selfish, self-centered, immature baby that ever walked on the face of the earth. Because every time something didn't suit you, you would pray, God, ding, 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 and then he would do it. No, 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 no. God knows what's good for you. God knows what's best for you. God knows what will strengthen you and mature you and what will create a great person out of you. And, and, and we, would never, we would never do this to ourselves. We would follow the path of least resistance every single time, and God knows that. And so sometimes God creates circumstances in our life that toughen us up. And we get to be a great person, an encouraging person, a faithful person, a strong person, a dependable person, a reliable person, somebody you can count on, somebody that's wonderful to other people because they know how it feels, because they've been through it. And that's why he said, I would rather boast in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ might live out of my life. I'd rather, I'd rather God not take away everything that bothered me so I could 
stop being a baby and people could depend on me. That's what he said. And that's life. And if you can't live like that, you can't be joyful, I can guarantee you. Because a lot of life's going to be just like that right there. It's not going to be all honey and no bees. Nothing hits harder in life. That's our favorite theologian, Rocky Balboa. Yeah, Rock said, nothing hits harder in life. And that's right, buddy. Life will lock the wind out of you. Number four, learn to trust God to meet my needs. The promise is, verse 19, and my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Okay, don't forget to buy. And my God shall supply all not just my spiritual needs, not just shall supply all of my needs and a few of my wants, maybe. <laughs> not promised on your wants, but your needs, he is. Do you remember, and some of you that have been in church a lot, you remember uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Sermon on the Mount? And you remember Jesus is talking on the Sermon on the Mount, and he's saying, uh, don't worry about what you eat. This is in Matthew 6. Don't worry about what you eat. Don't worry about the clothes you put on. Don't worry about where you're going to live because I clothe the lilies of the field and nobody's ever been that beautiful. Uh, you know, I take care of the foxes, have dens and the, all that. I mean, he says, I'm going to take care of the birds, you know, and aren't you higher than the birds and all that kind of stuff. And he, and he comes to a conclusion. He said, now don't worry about all that because if I do it for them and you're much more valuable than that, that I'm going to do it for you. And then he says this. Remember this. This is the key. Do you know what a conditional phrase is? A conditional phrase is, that I'll give you this, 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 this. And then you get the condition, if. If. All right. When he says birds and the clothes and the food, and all, it's conditional. He said, but... Seek ye first. Don't worry about all that stuff. That's what he says. Don't worry about it. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added to you. You know what the condition is? The condition is he'll take care of all that if I seek him first. In other words, welcome to Jesus Christ's mutual life. All the premiums paid by the agent with one condition. You got to be related to him. That's right. You have to be related to him. It's all permanent. You got to be related to him. See, uh, let me let you in on one little tiny secret, and I'm going to say amen. And I didn't preach nearly as long as I did last week, so y'all be happy. Um, one little secret. You and I were built for Christ. God made us for Christ. He made us to be occupied by Christ. He made us with this little God-shaped vacuum right in the middle of us. And we try to fill it up with all kinds of stuff because it's a vacuum, and we, and we sense it. So we try to fill it up with popularity, success, money, image, looks, stuff, possessions. But it, it won't fill up. It still keeps vacuuming because there's only one thing that will fill it up, and that's the presence of Jesus Christ. And until we, until we put Christ there, we're going to be searching. We're going to be longing. And it makes us vulnerable because people take advantage of that. When they see us searching and they see us longing and they see us trying to find something, they say, I can take advantage of that. 
And they'll take advantage of that if they can. And I'm just telling you that what you're searching for is what God created you for. And that's for Jesus Christ to fit right here in the center of your life. And if you will put him first place in your life, he says, and all these things will be added to you. If I seek him. So, so what is it that's keeping you from joy? You're comparing yourself to everything? Can you handle change? Won't recognize the power of God? Won't give yourself to Christ? Paul said, I've learned how to be content. And, and we must learn it too. None of us have it naturally. We have to learn. Thank you.